Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening and welcome to the first committee meeting of the Central Area Elementary School Capacity Relief Boundary Study. Uh, we're here at George Washington Carver Center. I'd like to invite all our committee members to please find your way to your tables. You can find your table by referencing the colored dot on your name tag. And we have nine different colored table markers throughout the cafeteria. We have some snacks in the back, uh, some snacks and water bottles. Feel free to uh, committee members to help yourself to those. Anyone in need of restrooms, restrooms are available out the exit doors of the cafeteria, past the lobby and past the stairwell doors on your left. There's a sign pointing to the restrooms. I'd like to make sure I invite everyone to please sign in on the sign-in sheets. There are two sets of sign-in sheets in the back, pink for observers and green for committee members. Please be sure that you sign in so that we can track attendance at these meetings. In the event of an emergency that we need to evacuate the cafeteria, uh, we do have several exit doors available to us, and we would invite to uh, regroup out in the parking lot and we'll check attendance against the attendance sheets. So again, please make sure you sign in on the attendance sheets so that we can cover that aspect in case we have an emergency. All materials covered by the boundary study tonight will be on our website. We have a website that will follow throughout the duration of this study. Our website can be found at the BCPS website at www dot bcps dot org if you follow the resources button at the bottom of that page and then follow the link to the central area elementary school capacity relief boundary study um, the follow following day after the meeting all meeting materials all maps um, all reports all materials consumed by the committee will be posted uh, you can also find the video links on those websites, on that website, if you'd like to follow along either live stream during the meeting or the video will be archived so you can watch it any time after the meeting. And those are available in multiple languages as well. Any, uh, anyone here tonight that wishes uh, to engage with Spanish translation, uh, Senora Frank is in the back raising her hand and she will be glad to accommodate you. And I believe our last of our committee members are coming in. So with that, I'd like to introduce the Director of Strategic Planning, Mr. Paul Taylor. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, everybody. As Chris said, I'm Paul Taylor. I'm the Director of Strategic Planning for Baltimore County Public Schools. I want to welcome you all to the first meeting of the Central Area Elementary School Boundary Study. This is the largest boundary study we've ever done but we thought it was important to make sure that all of the schools that could possibly be affected were sitting at the table helping make this decision. So I wanna thank you for all the hard work and important work you're about to do on behalf of the families of BCPS. My office, the Office of Strategic Planning is charged with managing the boundary process for Baltimore County Public Schools to ensure compliance with policies and rules and adherence to established practices and maintaining consistency throughout the process. The staff of Office of Strategic Planning will attend these meetings and be available to answer your questions during and in between these sessions. So I'd like to introduce those people. Um, Melissa Appler is the coordinator, if you could raise your hand. These are the people who, we're the ones that logistically manage this stuff and we're the ones that, that put things together and call you and send you emails, et cetera. So we're the ones that you can contact if you have questions. Um, Mike Godfordson, the specialist in our office, he is the designated person to communicate with the committee. So you'll be getting a lot of emails from him, and if you have any questions, if you're not gonna make it for some reason, which we hope you always will, um, he's the one that, that you need to communicate with. And Chris Bricado, who we already met. Also attending these meetings are representatives of various BCPS departments and offices. They are here to answer your questions and provide additional information that the committee may require. Uh, let me start by introducing 
Mr. Pete Dixit, he is the Executive Director of Facilities Management, and he's responsible for our office. Um, I'm going to mention the office, and if you're here representing that office, if you could raise your hand and introduce yourself. Uh, school leadership, is there anyone here from school leadership? Any executive directors? Just give us your name. Good evening, my name is Stephen Benner. I'm the executive director from the Department of Schools, and my partner just walked in right behind me. I'm gonna hand her the mic. Good evening, everyone. Sharonda Gregory. I am the executive director for elementary schools in the Central Zone. Uh, is there anyone here from the Office of Communications or Community Outreach? Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, Charlie, uh, thank you. Uh, Charlie Herndon, uh, you know, communications, communications specialist. So. Nice to see you all. Thank you. Uh, Office of Government Relations and Constituency Services. Good evening. Oh. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony Baysmore. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Constituency Services, so thank you. The Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Douglas Handy, Executive Director. Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency, and I am joined by one of my team members. Hello, my name is Jennifer Audlin, and I'm the Central Zone Equity Specialist. The Department of Academic Programs and Options. Good evening, everyone. Leanne Schubert, I'm the Director of the Office of Educational Opportunities. The Office of Special Education. Jason Karolkowski, Specialist Public Placement. Is there any office that I missed? Can't really see. Oh, Transportation. Good evening, Kenny West, Manager of Operations, Office of Transportation. Did I miss any office that's here? Thank you all for being here. And again, these people will be um, interacting with you. If you have questions, we can grab them and get your answers right away. If you need additional information, Whatever information the committee needs, we're going to be responsible to make sure you get that so you can make an informed decision. But I also want to thank BCPS TV. They are the group that are the magicians who make all this work. This is live streamed, it's recorded, um, and we have to work with them very closely to make sure this all works out well. So thank you for being here. Let's see. The other important group of BCS stakeholders in attendance are observers. We thank you for coming here. Please remember that although you do not interact with committee members while the official meeting is taking place, your feedback is critical and can be provided via the BCBS website. More information will be provided during this presentation regarding that. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Matt Cropper, Sean Dowling, and James Cooper of Cropper GIS who will be facilitating this committee meeting. Thank you, Paul. And uh, Chris, did you have something to say? Yeah, just wanted to, uh, uh, one, one more reminder. Um, as Paul mentioned, we are live streaming here tonight. It's very important for our observers at home and for the public record that we capture your voice as well. I know you all have great indoor voices, but um, we're gonna do our best uh, when, it, when it comes time that, that the committee is maybe reporting out and speaking. Um, please make sure that we get a microphone to you uh, before you start speaking so that we can uh, get your, capture your voice as well for the recording. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris, and thank you all for coming. We really appreciate you guys being a, a part of this process. As Paul says, um, this is the largest process that the district has ever undertaken in terms of boundary changes. Um, and we've been doing this for a long time with the district and with a lot of other schools. And so um, we have a lot of experience in doing this, but um, just be patient and, mi and mindful that we have a, a large group here. So we have it formatted to try to make sure that we streamline input and, um, and, and make the process as efficient and smooth as possible. Um, we are Cropper GIS Consulting. We're a K-12 planning firm. Uh, we um, work remotely, so we have a staff all over the East Coast. Um, but I'm Matthew Cropper, and I'm the president of the company. I've been doing this for over 20 years and facilitated studies across the United States and done several of them here in Baltimore County for about 15 years or so. 
Um, and so I'm honored to be here working with you on this, on this particular study. Also, I have James Cooper from our office here, and then Sean Dowling uh, is in the back there. They're both from our office, and I think you guys maybe help with the microphones. If people have questions, you know, make sure that we, we get people with microphones so that the public can hear what's happening, and, and it can be also, you can go back when they're looking at a recording, you can see what people are saying. Sometimes I go back and look at the prior meetings and look at what was said, so it's good to have things on the microphone. Um, so we have a pretty full agenda tonight. Uh, we have, starting at now, we're going all the way to 8.30. We're gonna um, basically go over some information, do a little considerations exercise, and then we're gonna, we have maps tonight for you, draft options for you to, to hit the ground running and start looking at. So there's a lot on our agenda, and we're gonna get right to it. Like I said, our goals are to familiarize the committee with the process, the timeline, accessibility and engagement. Uh, we want you to review the background report, which you guys all should have picked up a binder when you came in and signed up. I think you all have those. And bring those back with you. You'll see the binder is a large binder and there's not much in it right now, but by the time this is over, it'll probably be pretty thick. So that's, that's for you to keep adding materials and we'll give you materials at every meeting. Um, we want to establish and begin practicing norms for committee engagement, and then finally get down to the, get, where the rubber meets the road and look at some draft options for starters. So the process is guided by policy and rule of 1280. Um, it's facilitated by an independent consultant. It's driven by um, community committee and principals, teachers and parents, so it's a grassroots effort here. And really it involves ex objective examination of data. Um, you guys are, are given the ability to look at maps, give us uh, input, that will drive changes in maps or new maps. So, um, so it's, really a, it's really in your hands to give us input and help guide this process. And then engage with the greater community um, about maps and make sure that they're involved and then ultimately recommending, um, providing a recommendation for the Board of Education for approval. There are 77 members in this committee. So there are 19 principals and those, those principals are here to give um, guidance and input but, um, and, and also um, opinions, but they're non-voting members. There are 19 teacher and staff representatives and then 38 parents, two from every school, and then we have an area educational advisory council chair. And uh, so we have a good well-rounded group from people from all over this entire study area to give us insight um, on things as it relates to what you know about your area. How is traffic like in the evening? Where do kids walk to school? Where are busy roads that kids uh, maybe not cross over? And th those types of things. Um, the, your local input is really important in this process. We ask you to suspend your parochial interests. So I know this is one of the hardest parts of this study is is you have to think of how we're thinking and how the district and the board have to think is what's best a solution for all students in this study area. You, uh, we ask you that you take off the parent hat when you walk into this room and put on your committee member hat. Even if there may be something that's impacting you, we need you to think big picture about what's best for the, the, the solution for all schools in this study area. We ask you to attend all the meetings and, and be representative of your community and tell us what things are like in the local area, but also think broadly about other parts of the area that are being considered. Um, we want you to ex collaborate exclusively with each other and ultimately uh, leading to a recommendation to the Board of Education. Here's our timeline. So we've got three meetings. The, really the focus right now is, to, is these first three meetings. And these first two meetings, we're looking at uh, some maps tonight, more maps, and then we'll have a no another set of uh, more maps potentially at this ma meeting. But when we get here, we're trying to sort of reduce down to a manageable number to present to the public. We have two public meetings in November where we're gonna share some draft options. And then, and then once we get done with the public meetings, we'll regroup for two more to, to, to start the process of finalizing a recommendation to be, to be delivered to the board. Um, with that said, I'm gonna hand this over to somebody from the equity um, office. If you'd like to uh, step up and Good evening. 
Um, so the reason that the Department of Equity and Cultural Proficiency is here is because we work throughout the entirety of the system. We work with schools and transportation and facilities and all of that. And a lot of what we do is talk about the impact of the decisions and the conversations and the choices that are made and both the intended and then sometimes unintended consequences of those. So we are here to provide that support to this committee as well. That said, our principals, our teachers, many people have come to systemic equity training. We know that committee members, you may have had some equity training and elsewhere in your life, um, but we are here to kind of help hold those protocols and to really support you as you're engaging in what could be some difficult conversations just because there's some difficult choices that have to be made. We do not ask you to shy away from those. We actually are going to encourage you to lean into those conversations. Um, but social norms kind of say when things get uncomfortable to lean out and make it nice um, and you know, kind of smooth things over. We do think there is a way to have difficult conversations where there's a variety of different perspectives that don't all come together and to really hold that space and then to be able to sustain and deepen those conversations so hopefully the decisions and determinations that come from this committee to go to the board for recommendations are the ones that are in the best interest of all of the students of these 19 schools. So, that said, um, you know, we have taken some time to make sure that we are providing things like translations of materials, that you are getting things um, that are you know, consumable here, but then you also have resources you can look at that if people are asking you things, of course, you're not to be discussing things outside of committee, but that you can still, you know, there's things accessible on our website. We also want you to really consider um, how to lean into those conversations. And if things are coming up and it seems like it's getting a little tense and you need to step away for a moment, please flag us over. Um, also, our people here, the employees that have been trained, principals and teachers and others, are going to do their best to hold each other into account, including you know, members of the public and others, um, to really you know, say like, well, maybe let's pause and let's come back and what are we missing, what are we considering? But again, we are here as a support. We will be at all of these meetings. So please use that. Please know that that's part of our norm and that we hope by doing that we are going to get the best outcome and the best decisions, um, recommendations made for our students. As you are doing this, um, please consider really sticking to I statements. Um, I know you are here representing schools and communities, but when conversations in particular feel like they're difficult, if we insert kind of invisible groups of people that aren't here, it is a little bit easier to lose touch with one another. And so if you are feeling a certain way about something, if you think something, if you have a belief, if there's something that you feel compelled to do or say, please keep those statements in first person because we find that speaking in first person really helps people to stay connected with someone else even if they have a different belief or perspective. Um, additionally, we want to remind you that this process is a long process and so there are going to be times where a conversation may feel unsettled just because there isn't closure, there isn't a determination made. Please know that's part of the process, but our comfort level usually is like, I want it to be nice and wrapped up with a bow and feel okay by the time we leave. That space um, where closure doesn't come tends to be a space of learning and connection and authenticity. So please hold that space as you're doing that. And then also, even though this is maybe the largest boundary study committee I think I've ever been involved with, I'm not sure about um, ever, but at least the ones I've been involved with, it does not mean that every perspective of the schools and the communities you represent is going to be here in this room. And so as you are having conversations, please be mindful of the perspectives that are absent from the conversation. And we're not asking that you try to represent those perspectives, but that you just leave them there. You ask a question. Who are we not considering? What group? What other things could come in? And again, if you need help bringing those thoughts or beliefs or perspectives in, please flag us down, ask some questions. We don't need everybody to have the answers, but we are hoping you at least can lean in and with the wondering and curiosity to bring about a more comprehensive idea. Um, so with that, um, just know that we're here. I think we're going to move on to... 
I, um, I accidentally jumped ahead a little bit. I know you did. So, I, so I'm <laughs> going to go back to, the, to, the, to finish the other slides, and then we'll get to the considerations exercise in just a second. I'll be back. I saw the word equity on the slide, and I was like, oh, that's the equities, equities task. So, um, but but like, like we were saying, we do have uh, making a lot of effort to make sure that everybody is involved and active in this process. Translation um, is available, online surveys, and, and multi translated in multiple language. Um, we do ask that, committee, that the committee work stays at the committee meetings. It's probably best not to have organized uh, meetings outside of committee to try to, uh, to, to work through things. We, we ask that you keep the committee work at, at the meetings so that everybody can benefit from your input. Uh, we do have some inclement meeting dates on the calendar. Um, and then you can also refer to some of the BCPS policies 0100 equity for more on systems commitment to equity. Um, we do have a website that's dedicated to this process, bcps.org, and you can go to the resources page and look at that, and you can find the central area elementary school capacity study. Um, there's a place there where you can, a comment form or anybody from the public can go online. So please tell people that uh, in your school communities or in your communities as, at large that they can provide input, and we, are, uh, we will be tracking that and sharing that information with you um, as it comes through. Um, the, this meetings are all live streamed, so people can watch them right now, and they're also being recorded for future review. And then there's also some public information sessions as well, um, like I mentioned, on November 15th and 16th, where we will be sharing maps in draft form to the public for their additional input, and that's accompanied with a survey. Um, and then, of course, you can always uh, refer to the public to the Board of Education public hearing in March prior to them making a vote on what, uh, what boundary plan they, they want to approve. Talk a little bit about this area and why we need to do this, okay? Um, by 2024, four elementary schools in this area are gonna exceed 115% of their capacity. We've got Timonium, Hampton, Carroll Manor, and Pine Grove, um, all well over 100%. There are also schools in, the, in this study area that have available capacity. So um, the, the focus, the purpose of the study is to relieve schools projected to be overcrowded and to maximize the use of available space in schools until additional seats can be added in the region through the capital program. So you'll see, you, sometimes you would look at, okay, there's a school that's overcrowded. Why are we adding students into the school that's overcrowded? Well, as you look at it, a lot of this is a team effort. We're trying, to, you'll see what we call a domino effect. In order for some schools to get, to, to get capacity, there's a, you'll have to take some and you'll have to give some. So there's a little bit of give and take and a push and pull happening with the boundaries in order to balance out utilization across the study area. Um, these are, this is the study area you can see right here and the color coding here shows the projected utilization. So you can see everything that's in orange is over 115% and then you get to the, to the red which is well beyond that. And then you could see, so there is an imbalance in utilization. There are some schools that have available space as shown in some of the green. And, um, and, then, and then even some of the yellow gets, is getting close. But the, the goal is to try to get all of this somewhere like in the yellow if we could, or you know, somewhere, someplace to be more balanced. A lot of schools involved in this, in this. And I think that one of the important things is we have you all around the table here to try to give us a solution for this area. But this doesn't mean that every single school in the study area has to be moved, or there doesn't have to be an impact to every single building if you don't feel it's, it needs to be. We were trying to minimize the impact, but bring everybody around the table to see if we can't come with a joint solution to, to give relief to schools that have it the most, which are these schools that are listed here. And you can see the long list of schools that are, that are, uh, that are available, that have some available capacity to help us uh, provide a boundary uh, solution. The schools participating in the study chosen to give the committee options of providing capacity relief in the area. Um, depending on the work of the committee, the final recommendation may only suggest changes to boundaries of some of the schools. That's just what I said. And so it doesn't have to be uh, uh, shuffling the deck entirely, you know, but um, it's up to you guys. We'd like to see what you guys have to say. These are the rules, rule 1280. So these are the rules we follow as we start to make boundary changes. These are things that if you, every time you look at a boundary move, you're thinking about moving a boundary one place or another, or you're looking at some of the drafts, 
always ask yourself, how are we adhering to these considerations? And are we trying to, trying to make ourselves better adherent to these considerations and try not to move further away from them? So the primary considerations are efficient use of capacity and then maintaining or increasing the diversity of schools to reflect the diversity of the region and the school system. So those are the primary ones that are identified in Rule 1280. There are other considerations for you to look at and think about that adhere with best practices in this industry. Uh, maintain the continuity of neighborhoods. So try not to draw the line down a residential street, if at all possible. Try to keep communities together. And if a community has to move, they move together. And try not to split up uh, residential communities, if at all possible. Be mindful of the impact of transportation and walking patterns. Number of times any individual students are reassigned. Um, be mindful of long-term enrollment capacity trends. Location of feeder school boundaries, so continuity feeder patterns. So this is focus is only on elementary schools. None of the recommendations when this is all done are gonna have any effect on middle or high school boundaries. But with that said, there's a relationship between elementary and middle in terms of how many students are gonna go from elementary school to a middle school. Sometimes an elementary school gets split. Uh, sometimes all of an elementary school go to a middle school. If you have to split an elementary school, um, which usually you do because of just the nature of where they're located and the number of seats, it's most ideal to have a split be balanced, like a 50-50 split. You wanna try to avoid 5% of a school going to, one, going to one school and 95% of the kids going to another one. Trying to keep them in mind, these children wanna have familiar faces when they go from elementary to middle school, some continuity there with the social structures, social dynamics that they have uh, built as they're still building. Um, additional considerations to use geographic features, railroads, creeks, major highways, those kinds of things are helpful to align zones, just uh, helps adhere to um, safety and transportation efficiency. It covers a lot of, checks a lot of boxes with uh, trying to uh, consider uh, aligning things with that. So you have materials, this is in the PowerPoint. Everybody has a PowerPoint copy in front of them, but you also have in the background report a lot of more uh, these statistical data here. But this just shows you the first piece is enrollment. Um, we could see that what is the, um, there is some post, there is some movement going on with um, programs. And so um, uh, we, uh, early childhood pro programs are moving at Hampton, Jacksonville, Mays Chapel, Pedonia, and West Towson. So there are some movement of programs that are happening along with this that we have to account for. So we're giving you a kind of a look at how it looks right now once those moves made before we make any changes to boundaries. This is, this, this is how the schools are looking once those program shifts come into play. And then this is what I really like to look at the most, the utilization side, because this tells me how full the building is or how much space there is. And then you have a minus and plus signs that tell you if it's minus, that's how many seats you have available. If it's a plus sign, that's how many seats you are over 100%. Um, so we'll help you interpret these if you need, um, need further interpretation and our analysts will, will, help, uh, will help guide you through that if you need, have any questions about this. It's a lot of information tonight and we don't expect you to take it all in, but, um, but we'll, uh, you, you'll get the hang of it as, as things mature and as, as the process continues. That background report is what you have in your binder. It's really designed to expand the knowledge of you guys. The most important thing about this is don't speculate. Don't say, I think the school has this many seats or I think it's this utilization. It's best to go to the background report so that everybody has a consistent message, consistent information, and there's no speculation going out um, and, and misinformation. There's uh, key sections of the, st of the report that tell you the considerations that I went over, the timeline, we have a lot of supplemental data, and then maps. Uh, we get a little bit into that. I think everybody's familiar with mapping conventions. Everybody, maps, I always say, are the common language um, across all, all communities that people know. The, you have the legend, you have your scale bar to tell you how far distance is from places, and then the north arrow to tell you which way is north. <clears throat> There's something that you'll see that we use a lot of and we're gonna be engaging a lot with in this process is what we call planning blocks. So when you look at your map, you'll see these little black and white dashed outlines and inside it has a PB number. That's the planning block number. It's a unique number. And so these are, think of these as building blocks, uh, puzzle pieces that make up a, an attendance area. 
we've, what we've done is we've, we've split the attendance areas into small pieces that we think at this draft form could move together. We're trying to not split communities and all those considerations we've talked about. As you look at this, if you think that the planning block needs to be adjusted or, or modified, that's input that we will take and we will update and modify those if necessary. And then underneath that planning block number is the number of students that live inside each of these little planning blocks that attends their zoned school. So those are the numbers that if you look at, okay, how many kids live in there? That's the number that you would look at. How, how many, 79 students live in planning block 412. And then and you can, then you can start looking at the utilization numbers. Okay, what if we move this area over here? Will you look at the planning block? There's that many kids. Can they fit there? Probably not. Maybe they can. You maybe have to move some other kids out to make them fit. That kind of thing is what is really the process that you start working through here. Um, this is something that's a very, it's a large matrix, but this is just gives you information on the number of students that live out of zone, but attend from, from out to a school from outside. So the top, it shows you the numbers that live in each zone uh, within Baltimore Co County Public Schools enrollment. This shows you how many are enrolled at each building. The green diagonal, this tells you how many are live in the zone and attend in. So when I look at this, I would look at say, um, uh, let's look at one here. Let's look at Pleasant Plains. 510 students live in Pleasant Plains. 15 go to Cromwell Valley. Two go to Lutherville. Seven go to Oakley. You can look at it differently. Padonia, 489 enrolled. Two live in Cromwell. Two live in Hampton. And you can kind of track it that way too. And then this is just a sum of these, these non-green colors that make up the total numbers that live out and attend in. So it's just a way to give you some more information on if you want to know how many kids are coming to the school from out of zone, this is, this is the data that I, we would refer to and help answer that question for you. We've covered the norms and expectations slide, and uh, so I think we're back on track. Um, so everybody did get a, a, a handout in advance of this meeting with the considerations. I think everybody got that, and we gave you a little homework asking you to take a look at that and really kind of review those considerations, because we really like to get your input on these considerations. Um, so I, what we want to do is um, have you work in some small groups. Did you want to help guide this one? There you go. We're back on track now, so. So hopefully you did do your homework, but as any good teacher knows, sometimes not everybody does, and the lesson will go on. Um, and we'd like to start you off by, if you could bring out if you brought that paper with you. If not, if you could take a look. We would like you to start to share um, with the group that you are seated with um, which of those two you would prioritize. And let me be clear on the parameters for this part of the conversation. We're ready to do that part, right? Where I just want to like tell them to talk well, about it in groups. Yes, okay, we're going to let them work in groups, and then first, we're going to yep. do the exercise. Wanted to make sure we were on the same page this time. So um, if you could, three minutes? Perfect. Oh, no. Three dots. Thank you. <laughs> we're playing charades, too. Um, so if you could, um, you had that activity. If you didn't do it, if you could take a look now at the different considerations. Um, and we're talking about there are primary considerations, and there are secondary considerations. Um, that are to be considered in this process. And that is part of the rule that goes along with the policy that governs this entire process of the boundary study. And so what we have asked is that with the three dots or you know, when you're in your activity, for you to look at which of these considerations do I value, are important to me. And at this time, we're gonna ask for you to spend about five-ish minutes it's not enough time, five to 10, but probably closer to five than 10, talking in your groups and sharing with the people at your table which of the three are your top priorities. Now, to be clear, you don't have to pick like one from primary and two from secondary. It's whatever three to you are the most important considerations from your perspective and share that with your table mates. Now, as you are having this conversation, I wanna be clear, it is not that we are trying to have you all align or have somebody convince you of something. We just want you to understand the different perspectives that are at the table, the different things that are valued at the table. Um, got it? Questions? 
Okay, so you're looking at the primary considerations, secondary considerations. Which three to you are the most important, are the most significant? And for you just to talk about that, share it with your table mates now, go. Oh yeah, definitely start with introductions, great idea.
So I'm just going to give you a one-minute warning. I, I do know it's probably not been a sufficient amount of time, but we will need to move on to the next part of this activity. So if you haven't shared your three, if you could at least state those in the next minute, and then we're going to move to the next step. Okay, so again, apologies on not being able to build in more time for this, um, but I hope that the conversation you have initiated has been helpful. And we're going to actually encourage you to continue throughout this process to revisit these considerations. Now, I did say to one of the tables, and I kind of want to repeat it for the group, the primary and the secondary considerations are what they are. This is built into the rule and the policy around boundary studies. However, you are all still individual humans with your own beliefs and perspectives and lived experiences, and so you're going to be bringing some of your own things. So what we are trying to do is sort of help you to reflect and center both yourself and this activity. So that said, each of you should have gotten three dots. Does everybody have three dot stickers? What we're going to do is, since it's such a large group, we're going to dismiss you three tables at a time to go over to that chart that is on the window. And we're going to ask that you take your three dots and you put them under the column that corresponds to the three that you personally are prioritizing. Principals are invited to do this as well, yes, because you're participating in the conversations even as a non-voting member. Yes, if you need more dots because you put them on your paper, raise your other at the back table, you can grab them. So these three tables here, can I invite you all to go first? And as our first three tables are going up, we're going to try and do a little crowd control. I'm also going to take this opportunity to let you know that there are some um, bottles of water and snacks at the back, and this would be a good time to grab one if you would like that. Pat. One other thing, please, if you also would uh, try not to put two dots on the same one. If you want, um, we usually say like one dot per consideration. So, you know, maybe if you feel real strongly about one, you know, you may be compelled to put two on the same one, but try to do just one dot per consideration so that we can see the consensus. I'm going to invite our next three tables up um, to try and keep things moving. So I'm going to invite this table right here. If you all could move over and put your dots up. And then if you all could go up and if the magenta group could also go up. Thank you.
really, really impressed with the civility of this group and uh, and, and single file lines. Great. Don't feel like if you know if, if you know what three are, you can go up and put them on, and um, you don't have to do it necessarily one at a time. But you guys are fine, no problem. And I'm going to invite our last three tables, if you would mind. And again, if you do, please don't bother with a line. Just link arms and in large groups, you can descend upon the uh, chart and put them up. Light pink group as well, you are welcome to come up. So as our last few committee members are putting their dots up, we are going to start to debrief this portion of the conversation in about 30 seconds. So grab a water, grab a snack, but then if you could rejoin your tables.
Okay. So we recognized that there would be a logistical challenge, of course. We recognized that there would be a little bit of a logistical challenge in having nearly 80 people convene on one poster board to put, or one poster to put all of their dots to indicate their, the, you know, individual preferences, priorities. However, when we were planning this, we decided that the investment in the few extra minutes of doing that, and by the way, you all were very efficient. Thank you for your compliance. Um, we, f we felt that it, was Im it would be helpful to do that because of the visual that it creates, having it all on one, in one place. We picked the dots, we picked the chart like this for a reason, and we didn't want to dilute the impact of the visual by putting it on two different ones. Um, that said, as you glance over, and what we have is um, some of our co-facilitators are actually counting and tallying up, but um, if you look at what's there, and thank you so much, James. James knows what I'm doing. He's standing to the side. What do you notice? I mean, just even without having the tallies, the totals at the bottom, and once they're done, I'll read them to you in case you can't see, but what do you notice just about where the dots are, where they're not? And this is an open-ended question, like just what do you notice? I would love to pass the mic to somebody who notices something about that. Thank you. Deb Miller from Jacksonville Principal. Um, it's pretty spread amongst all of them. I don't know that there's any that are outliers. One is an outlier. The rest are pretty spread. Thank you. Do you want me to read you the numbers? Can everyone see them? You good? Can't see them. Yes, I will read them. So under the primary considerations, the first one, efficient use of capacity in affected schools is 35, maintaining or increasing the diversity among schools to reflect diversity of the region and of the school system is 40. And then moving to secondary considerations, maintaining continuity of neighborhoods, 41. Impact of transportation, 20, and pedestrian patterns on students, 22. Minimizing the number of times any individual student is assigned to another school, 19. Long-term enrollment and capacity trends and future capital plans, 28. And location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns is three. Okay? I saw another hand. I will come back. We've got another mic over here, too. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Manny. I'm the uh, co-chair of the Central Area Advisory Council. Um, I think looking left or right is kind of a natural thing, and it'd be interesting to see if we do this exercise again, if we change the order of uh, what's important, if, the, if we come to the same conclusions. Thank you. See a hand over here. Hi, I'm Emily Tucker. I'm a Rogers Forge parent. And as a parent, the feeder schools was an uh, important issue to me. And I was really surprised that only two other people thought so. Um, so that was just interesting to me. Um, I want to stay in public education. I want my kid to go to public middle school. So um, that's a concern as a parent. Thank you. Other things you're noticing, wondering? Yep. Right up here. This is Scott Conway, um, principal at Hampton. I think that the considerations are gonna be different too. It'd be interesting to see. I mean, you just see stickers, but I guarantee you my consideration over appearance is different, where mine is all based in, I don't live there. Mine is based on my kids. Most important for me would be how many times are we gonna move kids back and forth? I don't want that for my kids at the school. So I just think that it's a testament then that why we need to listen to each other and understand different points of view. Thank you. Go here and then here. Um, I'm a parent at uh, Riderwood um, Elementary and um, I'm glad to see that people also care about like the continuity of the neighborhoods um, 
because I think that that is a big deal when one side of the neighborhood goes to one school and another side of the neighborhood goes to the other school. Um, I think that that can get really sticky. And Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Eric. I'm a parent at Hampton Elementary. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't actually turn around to see who from Rogers Forge spoke earlier about the feeder school pattern. Hi, Emily. Um, uh, one thing that my table talked about in our discussion was that a lot of the secondary considerations are kind of interrelated in some way, like the feeder school boundaries. I mean, that kind of plays into continuity in neighborhoods as well as impact to transportation, and so perhaps that could explain why things shook out. They're all interrelated, I think. Thank you. We have time for one more over here. Hi, my, uh, my name is Lazarus. I'm a, uh, a parent at Carroll Manor. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is that these are all very valid and for different things, for different ways, but we need to have good information to make sure that we apply all these. And there were two in particular, just off the top of my head, there was two that I think come into play in terms of making sure we have the information to make sure these goals are met. One is the um, making sure the number of individual students are not assigned to another school. Well, do, do we have, hopefully we'll get some information on who's been moved in the past, who will be moving from other studies and things like that because you know, we don't always know. I mean, we might know if somebody is, is from the area and can comment, but it would be good to have sort of a list of the specific planning blocks that have already been moved before so that we can try to keep those people at least staying where they are. Um, and another thing is we, we talked a little bit about was um, the one thing about the long-term enrollment and capacity for the future capital plans is do we know future capital plans? Like if there's any information that we can get that says maybe this school might get more capacity in the future or something like that, then we can take that into account. Like I don't know if that information is available or if that's something to do, but having the better information is always a useful thing. So if anything like that can come out, it can be helpful. So. Yeah. Thank you. Those are two very good points. We do have that data and we'll provide it at the next meeting. And to that point, I believe you all have, are there sheets on their tables or if they have questions, they can, the parking lot, the orange. So if those things come up, Feel free to raise a hand and ask any of us. Um, even if we're walking around and it's during committee conversation, we'll do our best to get an answer to you. But if it's something we need to come back to, please put it on those parking lots because we do want you to have that information that does feel critical in those moments. Um, the other thing as we wrap up this portion of our conversation I wanna say is this specific activity is not something that we have always done in our boundary study meetings. And we recognize that to just say it's a primary consideration, to just say it's a secondary consideration does not make it so. That you are all here because you have an interest, you have vested interest in the schools that are being considered for these boundary changes. And so I would, um, we wanted to, to really take the time to have you consider what they mean consider what they mean to you as we're asking you to employ them in this process and then understand even where each other sits with this. Um, so as committee members, you're being asked to hold them, but you know, what does it mean? And then to continue to you know, ask that question and push on each other as you're making these negotiations through the process. So thank you so much for your very thoughtful um, engagement in this and we will be around if other things come up. I'll hand it back over. Thank you very much, and I, I, I concur. I think this has been a very helpful and informative exercise to see um, how this, the group in the, in the study area feels about the considerations. Um, like, we, like she said, they are what they are. These are the rules, but um, it is something that to be mindful of and see how, um, how each committee member uh, feels. About, and then you can see that they're, all of them have stickers on them. So they all have priorities to people. So you just have to make, you know, be mindful of this, but as you work towards um, looking at boundaries, just, be, just keep in mind the considerations and rules um, as, as you evaluate options and look at the data. Um, we have two maps tonight. I think you guys have already seen when you came in, you get two, two draft options right in front of you. 
You, I've seen people already trying to interpret the maps, looking at things. Well, how does it look? How are these areas moved? So you've got uh, eight and a half by 11 maps in your packets. There's also the large plot maps. Um, we also have a really nice uh, interactive map that you can uh, pull up and uh, you could look at it on your phone, which I think is a really useful utility, but it's basically something you could turn on walk zones, turn on and off the options. It's BCPS CES 2023. You can zoom in, see more detailed roads and things like that. And so uh, that's something that we can help you with or doing your homework when you go home, I would certainly recommend the online map, especially given the size of the study area. Um, and then we have all this is on the web page. So any member of the public who wants to uh, see anything or uh, look at any materials can, can access all of that online at the BCPS um, boundary change uh, page. I want you to remember that we've got two maps in front of you. These are drafts. These are not set in stone. Nothing is final by, by any means. So really we're just giving you a sort of a starting point that as we a Cropper GIS have evaluated ways to try to balance utilization and here to the other considerations. We've given you two maps to start with. We just want you to react to those, give us input, tell us what areas you like, what you don't like, and we can take all that input and look at coming back with some modified maps, some additional maps. So the focus now isn't to say, I like this one the best, I don't like that one. I mean, you may do that, that's okay. But also say, I wish that it had this. I really don't like this about this map, but I like this about that map. And that helps us take notes and think about how to come back with some modified maps for you guys to, um, to, to, to respond to that, that t incorporates your input. We've got two more meetings after this before we start narrowing. And so, um, and so we have time. I always say, you know, look at the maps. I like to look at the maps first, me personally, because I'm a mapping guy. And so I look at the maps, see how the maps look, but then also take a step back and say, okay, what does this all mean in terms of the numbers? And go to the tables and review the tables and see how the enrollment looks with the, the options, with the current and the option. What's the impact on demographics and utilization, feeder patterns, how many kids are impacted? A lot of that stuff is in there. Um, and then always be mindful of the objectives and considerations as you look at these and try to make things in adherence with those objectives and considerations. So just a quick review of the data. We've got data in a lot of different formats in your book. We've got the estimated enrollment. So this is as of end of year 2022-23 enrollment. Um, and this shows you what the current enrollment is uh, uh, post post movement of, uh, with including post movement of some programs, and then what is each option estimated in terms of how many students would be estimated to be in each building. Um, so that's, this uses say how many kids do you think the building the school is gonna have? What's the estimated enrollment? This will give you that number. Then I prefer this, that just the same data, but just looks at it in terms of percentages. This is how full is the building, and this is what I like to look for to see, like look at how much imbalance there is with the current, and then you're looking at the options, you can see how much balance is, is incorporated into, into the map. And so just look at the utilization numbers. This will help guide you say, okay, I, I like this map, but I think that this area shouldn't be in this school. Look at that planning block number. How many kids are there? Okay, okay, well, there's that many students. This one has 28 seats. Okay, so that may work or whatever. You know, that's kind of how you work with it. Demographic data, and this is just a sample, so I would encourage you to look at your background report because the, this is just a sample. The background report has all three, um, all current and then option one and option two in it. Um, and this shows you the uh, demographic data in terms of race and ethnicity, um, uh, economic disadvantagement, free and reduced meal percentage, and English language learner percentage. Everything that's blacked out are those that have been redacted because there's less than 5% uh, in that particular category. So we're doing that just to further in, uh, ensure the uh, privacy of individuals. We have impact numbers. So this tells you how many students are impacted in option one, how many are impacted in option two. This, these tables tell you how many kids are moving from building to building. So anytime there's a tan colored cell, this tells you 21 students are moving from Hampton to Oakley, uh, 51 Carroll Manor to Jacksonville in option two. 
And, um, and so and anything that's green tells you 286 students that are in Carroll Manor stay in Carroll Manor. So this tells you, if you want to know how many kids are moving from one school to another, that's how you would pull this up and say how many students are moving from one school to another, and so on and so forth. Feeder pattern data, this shows you the percentage of the school that feeds in. So we got the current, and then for the option, what does it look like? How many, how, what's the percentage, and what's the impact? Um, this, we do count the total number of splits. So we've got currently 11 splits from elementary to middle that, we've, that we count by looking at how many splits are occurring. And then an option, we total them up. So you could see that we have reduced the number of splits while looking at all the other factors. And so this is the split data um, for feeder patterns. Walk zones, we, we do our best to maintain walkability at, at all costs if we can. But you'll see that there are some challenges in this area where there are students who are um, being um, moved from a walkable situation to a situation where they're probably going to need to be transported. Most, most of this is occurring around the Pedonia area, I believe. And, um, and so that's, this is such a small zone, but they need relief uh, as, as, as we have drafted so far. It's up to you to, 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 to make that determination, but that's where you see the impact on walk zones. So there is an impact on students that can walk and it's reduced a little bit because of us having to reduce that Pedonia zone to get them under um, 100%. You got option one. This uh, gives um, just a quick overview. When you look at the map, the background color is the, is the option and then you have the black outline that shows you the current zone. So you can always see where the, the black outline deviates from the background color is where areas are moved. And we have James and Sean and uh, BCPS staff will help you interpret that if you have any questions about that um, to see how things, are, how things are, are, are shifting in each option. In this option, we do provide capacity relief to Timonium, Hampton, and Pine Grove. Uh, they do, Pine Grove does still remain over 100%, 100% although they do get relief. Um, all schools are within 8% of the study area average of 96%, so we're trying to look at things as it relates to that total average. Um, this option impacts the largest number of students, 1388, uh, and then there are 53 students who are walking who are impacted in this. Uh, but the feeder pattern splits go down from 11 to 8. So there's uh, different things that you can see, and this is our sort of just rough interpretation. You guys uh, can certainly add to this list of the things that you identify. Option two, again, background color shows you the, uh, the changes and, um, and the black outline shows the current boundaries. This map provides capacity relief to Timonium, Hampton, Carroll Manor, and Pine Grove. Um, Oakley is over 100% and Pedonia as well, but they do get capacity relief. And then all schools are within 8% of the average. So they're drawing closer to the average in terms of utilization. This one impacts fewer students um, and fewer walkers, uh, but feeder pattern splits also go down from 11 to 6. So giving you some just a quick insights as it relates to those considerations that we've been looking at. Um, and so with that said, what we want to do is with this size of a group, you guys are all around your little table. So we're calling these micro groups, your color ta the tables with your color numbers. So we're going to have you guys work in micro groups. And each micro group is going to evaluate the options, OK? So you guys are going to work 25 minutes or so talking about the maps, telling, like, trying, to, trying to document which ones, what, your comments from the micro group, try to streamline it maybe on a single map, so that, on a map so that you can, you can mark on the maps, you can use the little post-it notes and put smiley faces where you like things, sad faces where you don't like things, X's and check marks, however we can know. We need to take that information, we need you to document the stuff so that we can take it and, and record that. But then those micro groups are then going to work combined into a subgroup. So then you guys are going to work into a, three tables are going to get together and work in a subgroup. And, um, and so we got one group, the, I think these three are going to go to this corner and we're going to, you're going to tape your, tape your maps up on the, on the, the glass or on the, the frame there. And then you guys can work around and the focus there in the subgroup is for you to streamline all your comments from the three groups into one map if you can. You may need to make multiple 
edits. Like there may be two, like co conflicting comments and things like that, but just try to get your information on streamlined into one maps. So try to condense the input from the three microgroups onto one map. I think you'll see a lot of consistent comments, and but then you know we want to have all the unique in input onto um, a condensed map for your subgroups. One group's going to be here, one group's going to be there behind Paul, and the other group is going to be over here by the energizing entrees section of the cafeteria. So, um, and then after that's done, the subgroup's work is done, then we're going to just have a conversation as a full committee and uh, try to streamline in input as you go, as you go from micro to sub to full to try to see if we can't get some tangible feedback that we can come back with and, um, and give you uh, some up updated maps with. Principals are going to facilitate the micro group work um, and just record and summarize questions from members um, and just document your notes as best as you can so that we can take that back to our offices and come back with some modified maps for you. Any questions while we, before we let you break the subgroup? Yes, ma'am. question about the Cromwell magnet book program. Um, are we treating Cromwell like any other school and we can put kids in there up until a, an acceptable number, like is 96 like the average number across? So is that like kind of a goal of trying to spread kids around and if we can get to 96, that's kind of an acceptable number and are we doing that for Cromwell? I or, or is it gonna be still a magnet or, because one map doesn't move anybody to Cromwell at all, um, so. Yes, I think uh, maybe somebody from the BCPS provide some comments on that. Sure. I think, okay, go ahead. Do, do you want to summarize or do you want to? Go ahead. There you go. Oh, um, are we treating Cromwell just like any other, are we treating Cromwell just like any other neighborhood school where I know there's a magnet program, but there's about 50 spots there, and they're at under 90% utilization. So are we treating it just like any other school where it's acceptable to go up to 95, 96%? So, Leanne Schubert from Educational Opportunities. What I would say is Cromwell absolutely needs to be a part of this conversation but the students who are currently at Cromwell applied to be in that magnet program. And as a system, we've made a commitment to families that we're never gonna pull a magnet program out from under a student while they're in the program. So when you're thinking about Cromwell, any changes would be incremental over the next five years with that kindergarten admission. So we're not gonna tell students you're in the magnet program, but you need to leave to make space. So it would be an incremental change as you consider Cromwell Valley Elementary. I would defer to strategic planning on adding and Hang on, one, one speaker at a time, hang on. So with Sorry. the kindergarten entry, that means once the once they matriculate up to fifth grade, the magnet program would be over. Is that what you're saying? Or you're keeping the magnet program, but you're letting other students also in. I'm, I'm just confused as to what that means. What, so, I'd, what I would say is um, what, that's a, it's a valid question. It's something that we will uh, follow up with you on, on Cromwell, give you a more clear um, answer and talk with the, the parties that can give the most appropriate answer for Cromwell. I think it's, that would be good, a good thing to follow up on the orange sheet for us to follow up with you at the, next, at the next meeting on Cromwell. I'd like to get us into our small group, micro groups, um, if we can, and then, and then so that we can make sure we have time. We wanna make sure that we don't keep it here until 9 p.m. So I wanna, um, one more comment, if you wanna make a comment or a question. Thank you, I had my hand up for a while. I, I would just like to understand um, when we say that we, um, you know, need to add students to Cromwell, you know, incrementally over time, and I know that we will follow up on this later, um, you know, we have one option that actually does that. So does that second option then contemplate that those students will be added over time, or does that second option add them immediately? Mm 
These are very good questions, and rather than us just try to give you quick answers, we're not making a decision tonight, but we, those are good questions, and we'll get you data, real data, for how many magnets students are in there, how many extra seats there are, because it's not 100% magnet. Right now, we have other seats that are available. And that way, you'll have data that you can use to make your decisions. Yes, and uh, one final thought that James helped uh, mention also, that the students that are attending Cromwell from out of zone, they're still counted in this enrollment. So we're not, we're, we're not or, these aren't all live-in counts. The students that are estimated for Cromwell include the number of students that are coming in to Cromwell from out of zone. So as, as they're estimated right now, the, the assumption is that Cromwell will maintain that same level of students coming in from out of zone. So with that said, let's let you guys get your small group work uh, working. Let's uh, take a look at the maps. Feel free to spread out open tables if you need to. And, uh, and then we'll get to subgroup work here shortly.
a lot of really good conversations going on, really uh, constructive stuff, really encouraged to hear. Uh, let's see like maybe 10 minutes max more at the micro group, and then we'll let you kind of get to a, a little bit bigger group to talk through um, some of your thoughts and comments. About 10 more minutes in the micro groups.
Okay, one just quick update. I think we're gonna call a little audible on the meeting tonight. I don't think we're gonna break into subgroups. I think we're gonna, I'm seeing a lot of good constructive input at your micro group levels. So we're just gonna give you more time at the micro group to work through comments and, and input, and then we'll let each micro group report to the full group. So we're gonna cut out the subgroup, give you about 15 more minutes with the micro groups, and then we'll report to the full group as a whole.
Okay, let's go five more minutes. Five more minutes in the micro groups and then we're gonna report out to the full committee after that.
guys about ready? You guys about ready to report? All right, I think we're going to um, regroup into the full, uh, the full committee. You guys could, uh, I think you guys could stay where you're at or, you know, however you want to do it. But what we, actually what we would like is each micro group, each small group to come up to the front. If you have a map, edit uh, or any markups on the maps, bring your map with you and hold them up so the full committee can see. But we're going to regroup as a full committee and just see what all the tables are saying. A lot of good conversations being had. And um, so let's start with the Magenta group. These guys look like they've been ready. They're, they're, they look like they're, they're ready to go. So um, do you guys want to come on up? Uh, micro groups, we're going to regroup as a, com as a full committee now. A lot of good stuff being said, I know. If you want to come up to the microphone, we'll make, try to get the get order on the floor here. Yeah, I'm going to try to get uh, try to get them to simmer simmer a little bit. We're going to go report now from the micro groups. Um, so go ahead. Here we go. We got you. Our comments uh, kind of pulled back from the map a little bit. We thought about, we, we discussed 1,400 or 900 students um, and families being moved between schools, the impact that that would have, and uh, in consideration that we know there are some capital projects for housing developments in our area that are on hold, but uh, that hold is, is ending. There are perhaps capital plans needed in the near future from the school system. Uh, we wondered if this disruption would would be shortly followed by another disruption in a few years. And so we wondered, kind of, is the juice worth the squeeze? Do we want to continue to disrupt the communities that are, with, that are in this area um, every three to five years? Um, or, or might there be other solutions that could allow us to, to hold until a longer term solution might be found through a capital project? That's one of the um, uh, pieces that we discussed at length. Um, the other is looking more broadly at the, um, the second of the primary concerns, which is diversity. And diversity isn't defined in the language that we looked at tonight, but we looked at it through a racial lens, racial equity lens. And we saw that the average, uh, if you look at the, the um, area as a whole, I don't have it in front of me, I think it's 26% of the students are black, uh, as is. And then in option, there are eight schools uh, I believe at current uh, that currently have um, populations where the uh, number of black students is at 26 per percent or less. If we move to option one, there become nine schools where black students are underrepresented versus the average as a whole. If we move to option two, there are 11 schools where black students are underrepresented compared to the area as a whole. So one of our primary concerns is increasing diversity, but the options move us toward less diversity uh, through that lens. And there are it is similarly problematic when you look at it as at um, economic disadvantage, which is 22% um, as a whole. I don't have all those numbers in my head because it's been a long day. Uh, but that was the second um, 
uh, avenue that we looked at. And then um, personally, we're with Timonium and Lutherville. The Timonium parents are at a school that is most um, over capacity um, from just their, their lived experience, keeping a personal, local, immediate to them and their families. They were unaware that their school was uh, so over capacity and, uh, and that it, so it, was not, it is not in their experience a problem. Um, now, th there are two parents, not every parent at Timonium, but that's their experience. Um, and then from Lutherville, um, in our experience, looking at our lens, um, our black population in uh, one option is reduced from 26% to 9%, and another option is reduced from 26% to 10%. So again, moving away from the goal of um, diversifying. Thank you. <clears throat> so just, yeah, very good, very good. Thank you very much. Paul, do you want to say something? Um, I've heard, I, I appreciate your comment about the capital projects and disrupting the students multiple times. I heard that in a lot of conversations. Just so everybody knows, there are no capital projects approved to move forward in the central area right now. If we decide, if the board approves that we can start doing capital projects in this area, it's five years before we open the doors. That's how long the state process takes. So that was one of the reasons why we knew it was okay to do this now because even if we quickly get something going, um, it'll be five years before the doors open on a new school. So thank you. Do you want to add one more, another comment? Yeah, just, just, just <laughs> thank you. And just to clarify from our discussion, um, the other end of that are uh, building projects that um, we know are, are happening in the area. So there's a 400 unit apartment complex uh, that uh, is is uh, in some level of development and uh, there, uh, a delegate or a county councilman press the pause button, that pause button is was for one year, will be up at some point. Um, and I understand we can't um, d deal with every hypothetical, but that was the other uh, discussion point on, uh, on uh, what may change uh, in the near future. That's a good point. And whenever we're aware of the development that are coming online in different parts of the county, the planning department tells us and we build those into our projections based on what the county says is approved and being under construction. Okay, who wants to go next? What group wants to go next? Um, well, I guess I'll pick on the red group because you guys are closest to me. So do you guys want to come up and say, uh, say your thoughts? Just re, uh, recap your conversations and um, with, for the full group? Sure, that'll work. Hi, I'm Deb Miller. I'm the principal of Jacksonville Elementary. The one thing that is a concern um, when we looked at the, the mapping is that Jacksonville, Carroll Manor, Mays Chapel, we are pretty rural up in our area. And so there is a concern. Currently, Jacksonville students have upwards of 55 minutes on the bus. And if we're moving around um, the one boundary study that we looked at, Carroll Manor kids have to, the, the group of Carroll Manor that would come to Jacksonville have to drive past Carroll Manor Elementary School to get to Jacksonville because there's not really a main road to get directly from one place to another. So I think the biggest takeaway that we took with these two is that the time of transportation from students, the lack of major roads between Carroll Manor, Mays Chapel, and Jacksonville, and the fact that the Warren Road Bridge is shut down every other year, and that, that gives us only one main road into that upper area. So if those, our Mays Chapel kiddos would be pushed up into the Jacksonville zone, we're gonna have a serious, I think, issue with transportation of the, getting the kids back and forth. Um, the second thing that we need to I think look at is the future uh, pre-K and force program that are coming to schools that may not be there right now um, are going to increase um, our number. Additionally, it, both Carroll Manor, Jacksonville, Mays Chapel, we still have a lot of new homes being built. And so that's a concern as well when we're looking at all of those numbers for our kiddos. Anything else? Okay, thank you very much. Any other comments from the from people from the red group? Okay. Okay, how about, uh, why don't we come over here? Do you guys want to step up? Yeah, sure. Good, e good evening, everyone. I'm Dan Pizzo, the principal of Pedonia. Um, so we had a unique grouping with um, Carroll Manor, which is a, a fairly rural area, 
and in, in turn um, speaking towards a, a, a densely populated area, which is Bedonia International, which is many apartment complexes, predominantly apartment complexes. So we went from analyzing you know, 30, 50 square miles to analyzing which apartment complex on which street was cut off. Um, so it was, it was a conversation that, um, you know, we're talking about Lock Raven Reservoir and Sweet Air Road, Sweet Air Road, okay. Sweet Air Road. Um, and then we're saying this apartment complex is cut in half. And so speaking on, on the Pedonia side of things, um, we, and, and, the, and the dots, we, we spoke to the importance of maintaining neighborhoods. Um, and should, and should there be consideration about keeping apartment complexes together? And what we see is if you receive a, a discount to move from a two bedroom to a one bedroom, do you also recognize that you're leaving your school to, to now attend Pot Spring or Warren or Mace Chapel? Um, so that's a consideration, but then when we look at student numbers, you know, that, that could be an 80, 80, 80 child swing from one school to the next. Um, Great group working with you, so thank you for that. But um, the, you know, the, the Carroll Manor considerations are, are very much um, what Ms. Miller spoke to, spoke to regarding um, the geography of, of the area, um, the the size of, of of the catchment area, and and so I sort of echo many of her thoughts there. What I miss? Thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you guys want to go next? Okay, you, you look like you were ready. You're walking up here. Scott Conway, Owings, or geez, that's my old school. <laughs> relax, relax. <laughs> Hampton Elementary School. Sorry, guys. It's been a long day. Um, so the main thing that we wanted to discuss first or that we wanted to consider is obviously there was a boundary study and there was a movement just recently, so a couple of years ago, not too long. We want those kids to be considered looking at our school as a whole at Hampton because we don't want to take kids that just were moved that came to a new school and then moving them out to another school. They're Hampton kids. We want them to be able to finish their school careers there, so just in consideration. Now, many of them, it looks like the move, if they started in kindergarten, they'd be in fourth grade this year, so fifth grade, they should still have an option to stay, if not, so that, that's one consideration. Obviously, we can't just focus on Hampton. We want to look at it for everybody. So we looked at different pieces on the map um, that would create what, what the committee's trying to do is put everybody in a more line capacity to 100%. Obviously, that's not going to be perfect across the board. But what we did notice, and some it was good to work with the committee because I'm not totally familiar with every neighborhood and having people that live here, everyone that lives here knows it a lot better. So even though we're trying to keep the integrity, as Dan said, with the dotted lines to keep neighborhoods, there are some neighborhoods where it, it seems like they're together, but if we look at it closer and, and you zoom in and you were actually to see a divide that there are places where you could keep kids and maybe break it down where it's 80 kids, that it really could be about a 40-40 split or a 30-50 split, and it'd be easier to move 30 kids than it would 80 kids. And just trying to see as um, you know, Sean was saying, we want to keep equity in mind of all this because we want diverse schools for our kids. That's the real world. That's what we should have. We should have diverse populations so we're all working together. So it's hard, just a small amount of time. So this is just a small amount of conversation right now. Thank you. So did you, um, I see markups on the map. Did you guys suggest some planning block yes, splits? There, there, are, there are specific places. Okay. There are some specific places where planning blocks are, and I know I talked with one of your group uh, members about a planning block adjustment. Yes. So uh, we will take that and look at making adjustments to those planning blocks to. to, to they're, they're all written specifically up there. Okay. 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 So you said they're written on the map, and yeah. we can and, and we'll. We'll make those cuts so that see maybe give you some other opportunities to try to further further adhere to our considerations. So thank you very much. Anything else from the group that um, that that you guys want to share? Okay. How about the I think the blue group hasn't gone yet. Does the blue group want to come up and share your thoughts? Let's 
So we looked at the two options and looking at the impact of students with option one impacting more students. Um, and then we kind of zoomed in and looked at places where it was impacting walkers, walkers you know, for one school who were cleaved off and then would have to ride through another school district to get to um, the school that they were assigned to. Um, and looking at, you know, option one versus option two and, um, you know, minimal impact. But then going in and looking at exactly what everyone else was looking at, looking at neighborhoods and communities um, that might be divided and are there, are there some trade-offs so that we can keep some neighborhoods intact as we moved through. Anything else? Okay. That's good. I know that this, there's a lot to take in tonight. You know, just, like I said, it's like drinking water out of a fire hose. You got a lot of data trying to take it all in and just interpret the data. So it's really good input. Um, so how about the light paint group? Light paint when I come up? Hi everyone, so I'm Fergal, I'm with the uh, Light Pink Group, we were Stoney and Halstead. Um, we spent sort of a, a fair bit of time talking about the general stuff and one of the questions that came up a few times was um, with the blueprint for Maryland, we're bringing in this new extra year of kindergarten and many schools are going to feel pressure to add classrooms for that and is that going to have an impact on the whole process? And well, We didn't have an answer but if something wanted to ask. Um, for our own particular schools, um, Halstead is unchanged so everyone in Halstead was very happy. <laughs> Stonely lost two neighborhoods and gained two neighborhoods and we felt as the Stonely contingent that given the capacity we have at the moment we could afford to take on those two neighborhoods without losing the children that we currently had and so if we kept those neighborhoods and made the school community bigger that we would have uh, better continuity and fewer people moving around so that was one of the major things that came from our side. And there's a few general comments about this school and that school and so on. And you know, we feel that we could improve the walkability scores over the, over the district with a few small changes. Thank you. So to make sure I'm clear, the Stonely moves, so were you saying that you think that as looking at the adjustments, the areas that are added to Stonely, were you, do you, are you like the way that the shifts were happened or were you saying to keep Stonely as is and add the students to it? We were saying we were saying keep the districts that we keep the neighborhoods that we have, and mm -hmm. if we have to add things because we're not over capacity, then mm -hmm. that's something that that's an addition that we can feel that we feel that we can accommodate. Okay. That we have room for that. So just make Stonely bigger, but don't take any kids out of it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. Um, anything else from the pink group? Uh, anybody else from the pink group want to say anything? Okay. Moving right along. I think I don't know if I've gotten you guys yet. Okay. You guys want to come up? What group are you? Green. Green, okay. Hi everyone, I'm Jason Garber. Green group, thank you very much. Um, the first thing we concluded was we need more information. Um, for example, what are the projected um, enrollment numbers moving forward post um, redistricting? So whether option one, option two, or any other option that will follow, it would be ideal to understand what those projections are. It would also be ideal to know the performance um, or the test rates and scores before and after as well and see that impact to see what schools, if any, are detrimentally impacted by any such change and what schools actually benefit substantially from any such, such change. Um, it would be ideal to know what planned and submitted capital projects there would be for any of the schools and whether or not there's any consideration for expansion or anything else um, that's foreseeable within the next several years. Uh, there was a question uh, about what the Title I threshold is to make sure that if, it are, if there is a question as to a particular percentage in order to maintain extra funding for a particular school to make sure those numbers are hit um, and that the children are not suffering from a lack of extra funding if they're at a magical number that takes it just under that threshold. Um, there, uh, I know, for example, there were mo in option one, there was uh, an issue as to jumping several schools. There was a, a neighborhood down by the Baltimore city line um, that was, I believe, presently districted to West Towson that then goes past Rogers Forge and West Towson in order to get up to, uh, I think it's Riderwood. Um, that seemed to be a bit extreme. And there were some, maybe one or two other examples of uh, neighborhoods jumping other schools 
and to figure out a way to make that more compact and make it more amenable to transportation, both not just to the children in terms of um, being fair, but also in terms of uh, conservation of transportation resources. Similarly, um, we noticed for Cromwell Valley, for example, there were additional planning blocks that would be added. At present, Cromwell Valley has no uh, transportation that's dedicated to go to, uh, go to Cromwell Valley that's outside of an existing hub. For example, Pleasant Plains parents may congregate and have a bus pick them up there to go to Cromwell Valley, but you're adding in neighborhoods that would require their own separate transportation. So there's a transportation resource allocation issue that arises in those situations. In addition, while there is no development project that you've indicated that is actually been approved, that's maybe fair, there are a couple that I know that are planned. For example, there is one at the, um, where the former Bed Bath and Beyond is off of Joppa Road and was a Towson place. The Kimco has already come to my community association to say, we're planning on building a five-story apartment complex mm -hmm. right there. So we know that that is something that's going to happen at, or likely to happen at some point. And so when I see two planning blocks where we're talking about multi-story housing, now, in, in I think it's option two, being districted over to Cromwell Valley, there's going to be an emergency situation at some point in the future that sitting here in the moment is foreseeable. Um, let's see. There are questions about the numbers. Um, we see planning blocks being moved with numbers, but we don't know the individual planning blocks and what that means in terms of busing, diversity numbers, and other such information that will be relevant um, to the uh, schools and the other, um, and the new boundaries. Um, let's see. No, I think that's about it. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Um, one thing to clarify is that when you were talking about capital projects and Mr. Taylor spoke, he was referring to school, ex school capital projects. So like future schools, future additions, there is nothing in the foreseeable future in this study area in terms of added school capacity that's been identified in the capital plan. That but is, it's not within the plan that's going to be submitted to the IAC, but is there something that's being planned to maybe include for future IAC submissions? Okay, so that's, that's a deeper question, so that's something that we can follow up with. But, you know, but you're talking about residential plans, yep. and that's something that can certainly you know, have an impact on what we're doing and I know that the district does enrollment projections um, and so that they take account some of that but um, but that's something that we will follow up on and and bring it back to you with some more information on that okay anything else from uh, from that group anybody else want to provide any input all right who have I not I haven't this back group yep two more Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Rowland. I'm the principal of Rogers Forge and I wanted to go right after this gentleman because he spoke a lot of what our concerns were in terms of um, you know, some of the boundaries are impacting Riderwood. Um, the three schools that we work together that our uh, maps really dealt with were Rogers Forge, um, Riderwood, and West Towson. Rogers Forge boundaries were not um, impacted in any of the options. Rogers Forge is under capacity by about 40 students. Um, we have an apartment complex literally across the street from Rogers Forge. I mean, literally, the bus stop for West Towson is there, and this is Rogers Forge. Those students um, are bused to, to, to West Towson, so we just felt like there's 35 in that group. Um, they, you know, it would be an easy move to, for Rogers Forge to absorb them. They would walk. It would be kumbaya as far as that goes. Um, so the other thing we noticed, though, in the options is that when looking at boundaries, um, 695 was taken into, I guess, account, and we were really talking about it, at least over in the Riderwood, West Towson area, you know, 695 is an overpass, so it's not really this group is on one side of 695 and this group is on the other, so using that as a boundary we didn't feel was as effective as main roads like Seminary Avenue, York Road, and Charles Street. Um, also, our boundaries do go down to the city, which is what the gentleman was talking about, and traffic is a lot, um, there's a lot more traffic down there, it's a lot more dense. So one of the options is actually having students um, go to Riderwood, which is further 
than West Towson, and we just felt like that was, wouldn't impact them well. But we think what, you know, in looking at the options, we understand the need to, um, to alleviate uh, overcrowding at Hampton, and, and so children are pulled from Hampton to West Towson, which makes sense in some respect, but then we need to alleviate West Towson in that respect. So we did our own drawing over there, so if you wanna look at option two, <laughs> um, looking at just pulling the Rogers Forge students to Rogers Forge to give West Towson some um, room to then take on the, the Hampton students. So the other piece is, is Rogers Forge. We have, we're a primarily walking community. We have one bus that has five children on it. Um, literally behind that neighborhood is a West Towson neighborhood. So when we're looking at transportation and, um, you know, schools not having transportation, that, that doesn't seem to make sense. So anyway, thank you. All right, so do you guys do have a map that has some suggested adjustments to option two? Absolutely. Okay, okay. We'll make sure we get that and, um, and, and, take, and take a look at it to bring it back for the next meeting. I think we have one more. Light blue in the back, or maybe two, yeah, well, yeah, one more group. Hello, everyone. My name is Tara Bullock. I am a parent. My child goes to Oakley Elementary. Um, I was telling my group, I felt like I was playing fantasy football back there. I didn't have any, what was going on? But um, as a parent and an educator, I, it's so hard for me to do this because I think as the educator, and I always think about how this impacts the teacher, having just these 20 or these 12 kids move from one school to another because it makes a difference. So it, that, it's a big deal um, changing one school culture to another. Um, so that was my first thought. But as a group, we talked about um, sending, zoning children to Mage Chapel and Cromwell because they were underutilized. And Cromwell is a magnet school for computers and now that everyone has laptops, I feel as though they, those children will be able to go and be okay, or my team feels that way. Um, we also wanted to, we also questioned why isn't Hartford Mills um, considered since they are in between a central, two central areas? Why can't they be reconfigured? Uh, why are they not part of the yeah. study area? I think I, I think it's I think it's just a matter of they're trying to they're trying to figure out if you know there's every a lot of schools in the county have needs and if I think if we we keep looking okay there's a neighborhood school here that needs that has needs we end up we're ending up with the whole county so they're trying to get keep it at a study area as a manageable size and they've identified schools that can provide relief to adjacent schools as potentially. And I think that that's where they just kind of like said this is this is enough, and they had didn't want to extend it any larger. Okay, and that was primarily we did talk about the same thing many other groups talked about transportation being an issue, um, and so that was pretty much it. Anyone else have anything they would like to share? Okay. Thank you. Um, so, a lot of good uh, input. I th think it's I'm seeing some common. Common threads, I think we have some, uh, some suggested changes to option two, and we'll bring that back. I, but from what I'm hearing, I'm afraid a, lot of the, a lot of the groups from what I'm gathering is, a lot of, the one guy said, juice isn't worth the squeeze. Sometimes, uh, from what I'm gathering, the kind of the vibe I'm getting off the groups is, um, are we making a lot of adjustments, we're impacting a lot of students, but is it really provide, getting a result that's ideal for these schools in the study area, the school communities? Looks, sounds to me like you're asking us to bring back maybe some maps that may not impact as many students and communities and try to focus more on um, the most immediate needs but try not to extend it as far out. Um, that may be something that I may be gathering. So maybe may coming back with a map that tries to, makes an attempt to move fewer students but still try to provide some immediate relief to schools have the greatest need. That's kind of what I am hearing so I think we'll try to do a map like that, maybe make planning block cuts and another map adjustments to two, bring back another map there. And then as you guys continue, you know, I would just encourage you in the next, we've got a couple weeks before we get back together, just to keep studying the data, study the maps, uh, study the options, and when we come back at the next meeting, we'll be bringing some additional ones and some answers to some questions you had and be looking at um, trying to see if we can't adhere to 
the, the concerns and the, and the desires of this community and uh, try to do the best we can to get a map and a, and, a, and a solution that meets the needs for you guys. Like I said, we don't always have to move every school, um, so maybe that's maybe we went a little too far in this last, these first two maps. But, um, but uh, I appreciate, we all appreciate all of your time. Uh, just any other comments from the group that anybody else wants to say before we let you go home? Um, so our next meeting is October the 12th, uh, right here at 6 p.m. Yes, did you want to? Oh, please just leave your uh, papers on the table. We will, we will pick them up. You've got your stickers on them. Just leave your, leave your parking lot questions on the table and your notes and stuff like on the map. We'll collect all that when you guys, after, as you guys adjourn. Well, thank you guys very much. We'll see you October 12th. Good, good night. Good meeting.